Well, hello and welcome to Tree School Online. I'm Glenn Ahrens, OSU Extension Forester for Clackamas, Marion, and Hood River Counties. And it's my pleasure to be your host for today's Tree School Online webinar. Tree School Online is a production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We wanna give special recognition to the Oregon Forest Resources Institute for leading the project and to the Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry for giving us a grant to cover our expenses. So before I continue, I have to say something about the wildfire situation that we're experiencing. Uh, first, I want to express my thanks and very best wishes to the firefighters and the first responders on the front lines, and also to everyone affected by these devastating fires. I wanna let you know that OSU Extension and, and the partners here in the Partnership for Forestry Education that we're, we're here to help and we're looking for ways to respond um, to help you all along uh, from now until the after the fire recovery stage. So please uh, get in touch with us and see if we can help you answer your questions, whatever your situation is. Uh, so with that, I wanna go back to, to our program today. Um, this is our first day of our next series of Tree School online webinars. And we're gonna have these on the first and third Tuesday of every month from now through June of next year. So we're gonna keep coming up with these, these webinars um, for the, the next, into the next year. And please visit the Tree School online page or other connections through OSU Extension um, on the Know Your Forest Org website uh, to look for more information about upcoming events. So uh, some housekeeping details about today's webinar. Uh, the Zoom toolbar should be located at the bottom of your screen. And if you don't see it, you can scroll your cursor to, the, to this area, it should pop up. On some devices such as iPads uh, or Macs, the Zoom toolbar might be on the top, um, and many features are accessed through that. The audio will be muted for participants. Uh, video is not available uh, for you in the audience. Written questions should be posted in the Q&A box. So we wanna focus uh, that for your written questions and we'll have a couple of Q&A sessions. The chat box is used if you're having problems, um, technical difficulties or kind of questions that aren't uh, related to the content of the program. Uh, so please don't post your questions in the chat box, but put them in the Q&A. And you can use chat also to send messages to panelists or other participants. Uh, there will be some resources that our speaker, Connie Harrington, has provided uh, to follow up. So you can go to the Tree School online uh, webpage, and there's a class guide page that has resources. It will also have um, a copy of the presentation and recording of this presentation. Uh, if you click on the webinar description on our resource page for this and other Tree School webinars, uh, both past and, and future, uh, you'll be able to access the resources that go with that, that talk. So this is being recorded and we'll post it so you can go back and see it again um, and also tell your friends and refer other people to this so they can watch it after the fact. Uh, another thing is that we're gonna be using polls, uh, find out a little bit about you in the audience uh, so we'll have a poll during the, at the beginning and at the end, and they should pop up on your screen in a box. And after you answer the questions, um, we'll close the poll. You can also close it out so you don't have to see it anymore, but then we'll share the results. Um, with that, I do have a disclaimer. Um, the views and opinions expressed by our speakers are theirs and theirs alone, and not those of OSU, OFRI, or the Partnership for Forestry Education. So with all that, uh, just my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, so Connie, if you would, you can go ahead and turn your, your video on. And um, Connie's worked in the Pacific Northwest for more than 30 years as a forestry researcher. I've had the pleasure of working with Connie for I think all of that time, because I've been around here longer than that. And uh, she's one of our silviculture uh, researchers um, extraordinaire. She has a particular fondness for neglected species, uh, cedars, pines, hardwoods, and, and also for non-uniform management systems, uh, which in recent years, it, we focus a lot on the effects of climate change on tree growth. Connie has degrees in forest biology and silviculture from the New York State College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and a PhD in tree physiology and soils from the University of Washington in Seattle. She's retired in 2019, uh, but she's an emeritus um, researcher with the USDA Pacific Northwest Research Station and continues to stay involved with her favorite topics and research studies. So I'm glad that we're one of her favorite topics and we can still get Connie to help us out. So with that, Connie, why don't you introduce yourself and your talk and then we'll go to a poll. So turn your audio on, thanks. 
Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, I'm really happy to see how many people have um, joined us for this today. I didn't know with all the fires um, if that would really hurt our attendance, but it looks like we've got a lot of people that are that are interested in learning about cedar. So hopefully you'll enjoy the presentation and there'll be some opportunities for questions during the presentation and, and uh, at the end. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just turn it back to Glenn for uh, the next section. Okay, I will run the poll then. So uh, you should see popping up a poll and you can just give us your answer. We want to know where you're from, uh, what you choose to say about yourself, if you're a woodland owner or a forester um, or other. So let's see, can everyone see the poll? I'm just waiting to see some answers coming in there. So I'm not seeing anyone coming in. Here we go. All right, and then it takes about a minute and we see most folks responding and then when it slows down or stops, then we'll, we'll end the poll. And in addition to questions about yourself, whether you are a forester or landowner, if you own forest land, Connie's got a couple of questions for you. So make sure to scroll down. Um, have you planted red cedar or have you tried managing the red cedar trees on your property or anyone's property? Okay, so answers are coming in. We're approaching the magic 80%, which seems to be about the rate that we get. Okay, lo and behold, 80%. And I think we're done with the polling. So this is your last chance. Very good interested to see about your experiences. So now I'm going to share the results so you can all see that about 60% of us are from Willamette Valley area in Oregon, and then we have spread out from coastal Oregon, uh, a good number from Washington State, about 12%, and two folks from outside of the Northwest. Uh, almost over two thirds are, are woodland owners, and then private or public natural resource managers, and then acres, uh, we've got 20% uh, that don't own land, but um, quite a few across the range, um, quite a few from 40 uh, to over 100 acres. And then looking at experience with red cedar. So a little more than a third of us, uh, no experience. And then uh, yes, less than 100 trees, about 20%. Uh, so you can see that um, some more than a thousand. That's good, do your part to grow red cedar. Uh, thinning or pruning, not so many folks have done that. So Connie will tell us more about that. I'll stop sharing and turn it over to you, Connie. Uh, thank you, Glenn. That was interesting to have the polls so we could see a little bit about people's backgrounds. Uh, just let me close this one thing up here. Okay, so um, uh, on this first slide, we have the kind of um, information from OSU and, and uh, Tree School. And my screen is not going down. Oh, technical difficulty. Just a moment, hopefully we'll figure this out. Is your screen frozen, Connie? Yes, my screen is frozen, Glenn. Well, why don't you try, can you exit the PowerPoint and try starting it again? Yes, I will try that. Gosh, it just worked great a minute ago. Well, we have a backup plan. <laughs> oh, yes, the backup plan. Maybe if I stop the share and start it again. Yes, yeah, so that's a good idea. Stop sharing. Okay. Now and then maybe restart up. the PowerPoint and share it again. Okay, it's working now, um, so I just need to share. Um, um. All right, please be patient while we resolve our technical difficulties.
Okay, we're back in business. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. So I just um, wanted to mention again that um, I, I, I represent the Pacific Northwest Research Station, which is a branch research branch of the Forest Service, uh, which is USDA agency. And um, I'm going to throw a lot of different kinds of information at you, uh, starting with biology and ecology, then going to silviculture management. Um, and we'll have some, we'll stop for some questions after the ecology section, and then we'll stop again after the silviculture section. I have a, a few additional um, slides about comparing growth of um, red cedar with Douglas fir that we could do at the end if there's time and interest. So first, um, just to be clear, we're talking about Western red cedar. It's the most common species in um, Western Washington and Western Oregon. Um, but there are four cedars, native cedars in Oregon. So we've got um, also yellow cedar, incense cedar, and Port Orford cedar. Yellow cedar mostly at higher elevations, Port Orford over the southern coast, and incense mostly in the drier sites. And sometimes we don't have as much information as we'd like for any one species of cedar. So um, we, we'll kind of share information. We'll just assume that if there's information on another cedar, it may be fairly close to what um, uh, to what we're looking for. So sometimes people say, well, is it one word or two? And the scientific name, Thuria piccata, it's in the cypress family, but it's not considered Red cedar is not considered a true cedar. So um, many organizations officially call it Western red cedar, but then use cedar as its nickname. But sometimes, especially in Canada, you'll see red cedar as two words, just in case you're curious about those things. Um, huh. my, my presentation has disappeared again, most mysterious. Okay, let me try this again. Honey, what? would you like me to run it and you can just tell me next slide? Um, let's see if we can make, let's try it once more. Okay. Uh, it should. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay. So sometimes when I've given these talks, people say, well, they're not really that interested in the biology or ecology. They just want to jump into management. But I think if you understand a little bit about the biology of the species, it will help you answer questions in your own mind about management. So one thing I like to point out is that um, the cedars have indeterminate growth. Um, you may be familiar with that term about like some tomatoes have indeterminate growth. They just keep growing. So the cedars don't have vegetative buds. Um, they don't have really winter dormancy. So they grow when temperature and moisture permit. They're very shade tolerant and they're considered to have less genetic variation than many other trees. So just to emphasize, red cedar doesn't have vegetative buds like pines or alder or true firs or other species do. It just has these um, uh, little leaf primordia, these little leaves that are just sitting there waiting to come out. So the fact that it doesn't have buds means it doesn't have a leaf bank. So if you, a species like Douglas fir, inside that overwintered bud are a bunch of little needles, needle primordia. And as soon as it starts growing in the spring, those new um, needles can be quickly extended, whereas cedar has to keep growing the individual leaves or these needles um, kind of one at a time. So it's slower to get started. So there's no protection of these new tissues inside a bud. Um, on the other hand, because it keeps growing when conditions are favorable, we think it will be a species that will increase under climate change. But on the other hand, it has greater herbicide sensitivity for a longer time because it doesn't have these buds protecting the leaves. So just uh, this example from um, up in British Columbia, if you can see, um, uh, say early May, 
the blue line, the Douglas fir has only grown in height about 5% of, of what it's going to do for the year, but the red cedar might have been 25%. Um, just because they, the growth of the cedar started sooner and it lasted longer than the growth of the Douglas fir. But um, diameter and height growth don't start and stop at the same time. And so in this particular example, the um, diameter growth started in February, but the height growth didn't start until March. And that's true for a lot of species that the diameter growth will start first. Um, that seems to be true for evergreen species. Diameter growth will start and then uh, about a month later or six weeks later, um, bud burst or height growth will begin. So um, we developed models where we can predict the shoot growth or the height growth of red cedar as predicted from temperature. And so for most of you, um, you probably live somewhere where it's uh, you're in the green zone, which means that height growth would start generally in March or April. But over southern coast down into California, it would start earlier and uh, up at higher elevations, it'll start later in the year. Um, however, we predict in the future that um, height growth is going to start quite a bit earlier in the year. So you can see the, the map on the right the majority of the map is now blue, indicating that the species is likely to start height growth um, in early March. So a question that has come up many times um, in different ways is, why do red cedar leaves turn kind of this reddish brown in the winter? And in fact, I've had quite a few people tell me that, you know, oh, I got these seedlings from the nursery and, and they were terrible. They were just all brown. But that actually is, is normal, that um, most of the trees in this family have, tend to turn reddish brown in the winter. And so I don't, ex this is not gonna be on the quiz, <laughs> but just, just in case you're curious, the cedars produce a chemical called rhodoxanthin, which acts as a sunscreen in the winter. And um, then it declines in the spring um, and then photosynthetic rates increase again. But there's very little change in chlorophyll. So this is quite different from hardwood leaves when the chlorophyll is, is um, no longer present. But light plays a role as well as temperature. So in the winter, if it's in the shade, um, the trees may not change in color, but out in the light in the winter, they often do change. But there's some genetic variation. For example, the horticulture industry has a, a, ver a variety called green sport that does not change color. Um, but if you see that red brown color in the winter, um, that's, that's okay. Don't worry about that. Um, but all red brown foliage is not the same. So what I tell people is if it's the normal winter color change, look at the underside of the foliage. And if the underside is green, it's good. And usually also the foliage is very soft and pliable. So if you're just walking along, you can just hold on to the needles. And if they feel the branches, feels foliage feels really soft and pliable, then it's, it's a healthy branch, healthy plant. But if both sides of the leaves are brown, um, and the foliage feels kind of rough and brittle, then that's when you should be concerned. Um, so reproduction, uh, red cedar has both male and female flowers on the same tree, which means it's classified as monoecious. And just these, if you take a look in February, you can often see the, the male um, or pollen flowers or cones at the tips of some branches, and then the female um, flowers at the tips of other branches. And there's, there can be a variation in the color, particularly of males, some of them more of the black and some more of this kind of reddish color. And then the females end up developing into the cones. And um, they're small cones, 
and most of them um, only have two to six seeds per cone. So very few compared to most conifers. And um, red cedar seeds can germinate in the fall if it's warm. So the these lines on the left in the upper graph, that's showing a very quick germination if it's 60 to 80 degrees, the red cedar can germinate in the fall. Whereas the lower graph is showing Douglas fir for comparison. So you can see it's much less likely to germinate and take a much longer time. And most Douglas fir seed would germinate in the spring. So sometimes people ask about vegglings or some type of vegetative reproduction it can be common in some areas naturally, but also sometimes people do this deliberately. They can um, cut branches and um, root them or actually use a hormone treatment, dip them. Um, and also you can also see this branch development. Sometimes a tree will fall over and then the branches can actually start growing upward and can develop into quite large trees. So moving on to some ecology. Um, I like to say that red cedar has wide ecological amplitude, which means it can really grow on a, a range of sites. Sometimes people think, oh, it just grows low elevation wet sites, but it can grow on sites that are very wet to rocky and dry from low to mid elevation. It can survive in the overstory, the midstory, or the understory. It's a very long lived species. It tastes good to a lot of animals, so it can be an important part of wildlife habitat. It's a consistent seed producer, although it doesn't produce every year, it produces most years. And it's uh, resistant to several root rots that are common in the region. The fact that it's shade tolerant means that branches can survive in the understory. Um, but because this foliage is an important wildlife food for many animals, it can create some problems when we're actually trying to manage the species. Um, but generally, if you have vigorous seedlings, they're going to respond pretty rapidly to browsing with new growth. This is a, an example of a top of a red cedar uh, a sapling that was clipped by a mountain beaver. and. Um, this was kind of a new phenomenon to me um, at the time when the mountain beaver were actually climbing the little saplings and cutting the tops off them. So um, sometimes they cut things at ground line, but other times they climb and can cut the tops off. So red cedar grows best when it has lots of foliage. So just as example down at the bottom, crown condition rating, the better the crown is, the more foliage there is, the more growth that you're going to have. I think that makes sense probably to most people, but, um, but just when you're thinking about the growth potential of a, a plant, just think about how much foliage it has. So for example, this is a young tree in the understory. Um, actually, this is behind my office. And it has grown quite well because it's in a little sunny microsite and uh, has a good crown on it. So it's, it's growing well. You can just see lots of foliage and branches. And I took this picture um, with a flash because it was so dark in this spot. And there was very uh, poor growth of this tree because it had quite a small crown, um, both due to low light and the fact that it had been browsed. So as I mentioned, red cedar can be very long lived. Um, this was up at the Olympic National Park and unfortunately this tree is blown down now, but, um, uh, but it was an amazing tree to see and the, the log is still there that you can look at in the staircase area. So just briefly, cedar doesn't really have a lot of diseases um, or other problems. Of course, nothing is perfect. There's no tree that doesn't have any problems. On wet sites, it can be shallow rooted and you can get top dieback, particularly if you have dry years. 
So these kind of spike tops you can see on um, uh, trees uh, out at the coast or other places, uh, they grew in these wetter spots and, and then when it got dry, the, the top died back. It can be, it can get wind thrown on wet sites, but wind is not usually a problem because the foliage is fairly um, kind of feathery. It's less susceptible to diseases that many, than many other conifers, but because it's so long lived, problems can catch up with it over time. And then sometimes people have had problems with this uh, cedar leaf blight um, on seedlings, particularly in areas that have poor drainage. It's not very much insect damage on cedar. Um, there's a gall midge sometimes on seeds, a weevil, bark beetles. Um, there's a borer that can cause some damage. In some cases, there can be sap sucker damage on the bowls. And some stems definitely are more preferred than others. So when we talk about pruning later, don't bother to prune a tree that has sap sucker damage because often the sap suckers will come back to the same tree over and over again. So uh, the last few years, though, we have seen more um, examples of cedars being in trouble. There have been some recent die offs, uh, could be just a, a thin crown or a dead top or the whole tree is dead. And this has been especially noticeable in the northern Willamette Valley, but um, I've seen it up through Washington and into southern British Columbia. And several forest health people have looked at this issue and they, they don't, haven't identified any particular disease or insect and feel that it's greater summer drought or heat are most likely um, to be the problem. But you can get insects and diseases in on weakened trees. So um, sometimes people look and they'll see insect holes or something and they think the insect's killing the tree. <clears throat> but in fact, it may have been the drought that weakened the tree and then the, the insect came in. So um, I've, in addition to being interested in uh, neglected species, I've always been interested in roots. <laughs> and so uh, I wanted to share a couple kind of root pictures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there, on wet sites, the roots can be very shallow, so you can, you know, practically be tripping over the roots. Um, and these trees on these wet sites will be more susceptible to wind throw than those growing on sites which aren't as wet. But not all cedar trees have roots close to the surface, so the rooting really depends on um, what kind of soil you have and, and how well drained it is. So cedars have a reputation for surviving an understory with, with uh, very little growth. And uh, sometimes people tell me, you know, oh, well, those trees just never die. And we've looked at that in several um, projects. You know, what happens to all these little trees? Sometimes you can get areas with natural stands in these real thickets. <clears throat> and so this is an example from uh, on the Washington coast. We had 25 years, so from 1980 to 2005. And the red stems are those that grew less than four tenths of an inch in 25 years. So very, very little growth, but they almost all survived. 94% of them survived. And we used to joke about them when we were out measuring those trees, they were like in suspended um, you know, animation or hibernation or something. They just weren't growing at all. Um, but that's not always true. And certainly on better sites, this is a site up in on Vancouver Island. Over a longer period of time, the trees that uh, grew so little, that four tenths of an inch, um, only 34% of them survived. So about a third. So, um, <laughs> Yes, red cedar is very shade tolerant, but all understory trees will not survive forever. So um, let's pause now and see if there's some questions related to biology and ecology before we go on to management. All right.
right. Shall. Well, we do have one question, and I would encourage everyone, as questions occur, go ahead and type them in that Q&A box so that we can um, get them stacked up and, and so you can put it down while you're thinking of it. So here's a question. Uh, what is it about Western red cedar, either biochemically or physiologically, that allows it to grow in such low light levels? And in other words, how do shade tolerant plants exist in lower light levels and are able to thrive where other plants die? Yeah, well, that's a good question, but I don't have a good answer to it. <laughs> um, you know, I think that in natural systems, uh, there's just a whole diversity of um, plants and animals that have developed in different niches and the shade tolerant plants have both um, positive aspects of their ecology and, and uh, maybe not so positive aspects. So they may not grow quite as quickly, um, but they can survive for a long period of time. And uh, you can read more about the physiology of, of uh, the cedars in one of the uh, references that I provided. All right, very good. Uh, another question has popped up. Uh, would the red cedars grow well among small oaks and madrone forests like in the Rogue Valley, Southern Oregon? Uh, they definitely can. I've seen them um, sharing space uh, down in, in uh, Southern Oregon, both cedar, both red cedar and incense cedar with, uh, uh, with oak. Uh, particularly with Oregon white oak, but um, I think and we could talk about this a little bit at the very end. It depends on what type of stand you're trying to have, whether you want something that is going to be more than one layer, um, understory and an overstory, or you're trying to get them at the same, um, the same level. Since they have such different growth patterns, um, it could be tricky to manage them both as overstory trees, but you may be able to manage them in clumps as overstory trees or manage them as kind of a multi-layered stand. I would think sometimes it depends on just how fire prone those sites are or um, the, you know, the soil conditions. It could be really harsh in some of those more stunted oak and madrone thickets as well that might not be suitable for red cedar. Yeah, it, it, I, I think that's definitely true, Glenn. And as I said, in some cases, incense cedar may do uh, better. And uh, like you say, fire can be definitely a factor in terms of uh, survival on those sites. All right, there's another question. Um, can you use a seed from genetically improved red cedar? Is there a genetically improved red cedar? There is, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in regeneration. Okay, very good. Uh, do you know more about the distribution and extent of the recent die-off? Is it dying in the Northern Rockies, for example? I do not know that. Um, I just know on the West Coast, it's been observed the last few years. Yeah, and on that topic, as you all might imagine, we're very concerned about it, and we're trying to put together a good kind of a task force, if you will, the scientists looking at the causes of this and, and what its distribution is. So I'd say stay tuned for more on that because uh, it has been um, quite a concern and very widespread. And that might be another reason where I'd be a little concerned about red cedar in the southern, more drier, hotter margins of its habitat if, if indeed it's the heat and drought that's causing this. You know, we're seeing, uh, you know, recurrent episodes of that extreme heat and drought. Okay. Um, if red cedar is predicted to be better adapted to climate change because of year-round growth, why is increased summer drought creating die-off in the North Willamette Valley? Well, what we, what we think is that um, it will be beneficial. It's a good adaptation for plants to be able to start growing earlier in the year um, so they can get more of their growth before it becomes droughty. So from that perspective, the fact that red cedar on you know, some sites could start growing a month earlier than it does now, that could be advantageous. But it's definitely a balance between um, starting early and then being able to survive uh, summer drought conditions. 
um, you know, some of the climate models predict that it's going to be warmer, but not necessarily less rainfall. So we'll, we'll kind of have to see how, how that works out in terms of um, how droughty it's going to be in the future. Yeah, it's kind of challenging to look at projected climate variables. I and mean, you look at one thing like the, the early spring growth, but if the other side of that coin is devastating drought in August, that's not actually going to allow cedar to survive. So we don't know how it all works together. and Maybe we have to just see what happens or get better data over the long term. Yeah, um, unfortunately, we don't know that for a lot of species. So yeah. <laughs> another one of those stay tuned. Are there any particular fungi associated with red cedar? Uh, no doubt, there are many fungi associated with red cedar. Um, you know, I mentioned that there are some um, of the, the stem or root rots, but there are, you know, beneficial fungi too. Um, they're in the resource, um, the resources that are online, there's quite a bit of additional information on the ecology and biology of the species that I think would be useful. Are, are you familiar with any particular mycorrhizal fungi or what kind of mycorrhizal uh, mushrooms or truffles that might be associated with red cedar? I am not. So that would be a good question for those mycologists out there. Yes. Well, that is the last question in the queue right now. Um, so why don't we go forward? Okay. So, um, when Glenn first asked me to talk about red cedar many years ago, I said, well, it's kind of a tricky topic to talk about because everyone wants to know how to plant it. And it can be a challenge to plant red cedar on some sites. Um, but Glenn assured me, and he's correct, that there, you know, not every site is going to have a lot of browsing problems. And there are some ways that you can get around those browsing problems. So, but cedar foliage is considered very palatable, meaning a lot of animals like to eat it. And it's available. Um, that is, you know, the leaves don't fall off like a, on a hardwood tree. Um, so sometimes you can hide the trees or protect them from browsing. That is, on some sites, people have been successful in keeping the site fairly brushy, unless they can protect the seedlings. Um, sometimes they use repellents or seedling protectors. So repellents would be like deer away or deer off or plant skid. Um, uh, in talking to some wildlife biologists who've worked on this topic, they, they recommend, if at all possible, you buy a concentrate or powder rather than ready to use liquid. It's more effective and lasts for a longer time. You could consider planting before harvest. So I know a few people have gone in and done some underplanting um, and been able to get the plants established a little bit before harvest. Yes, some of them will be damaged during harvest, but they'll um, but you may be able to get quite a few, you know, up to a few feet tall before you actually take the overstory off. And then we hope there'll be a future use. Uh, for browse resistant clones. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a, in a couple minutes. So uh, where to plant red cedar? Well, you can plant it on wet sites or dry sites or in between sites. You can create multi-layered stands. So you can plant it so that it's uh, an even age stand. Um, I know some people have deliberately planted it in Felinus root pockets because it's resistant to the Douglas fir variant of the disease. Um, sometimes it's planted in riparian areas, uh, but it could be planted really wherever you want to manage it, um, with the exception, as we've talked about before, for, for sites that are very droughty in the summer. So. Um, Although there is a, a recommendation, and I recommend that you consider keeping the site fairly brushy um, if you have a lot of browsing pressure. But red cedar will go, grow better when 
competing vegetation is controlled um, as long as the animals uh, will leave it alone. So there, there's that trade-off. And I know uh, people try and manage it in a lot of different ways. Some people like to have a really clean site, but then when the deer or elk go through, they'll just, they can mow the seedlings down. Whereas if there's a lot of other choices to eat, they'd be less likely. If you are gonna spray, notice on this uh, picture that there's a cone um, that's kind of directing the spray aw away from the tree. So, um, red cedars can be damaged by herbicide because they have that foliage that doesn't have the buds. So it, it can be damaged for a longer period of time than species that set a harder bud. Uh, oh dear, back again. Look at this. Guess you learned the ropes on this little glitch, huh? I don't know what's going on here. I think I I've got the got it figured out now. Okay. Okay, so um, seedling protectors. Um, there's a lot of different types. They're tall ones that protect the seedling longer, but they're harder to keep upright in the wind. You need uh, two stakes per tube for the, the taller ones. Ones that are mesh have less of a sail, but the branches and leaders can escape out the sides of a mesh like a Vexar. Um, color doesn't man matter much for shade tolerant species like cedar. Um, but I do recommend that if you're going to put protectors on that they be checked regularly. So uh, this is a research paper uh, we did a few years ago. We evaluated different types of protectors and they all can work you know, pretty well. Um, seedlings and protectors are, they're protected from browsing into the leader or branches exit the protector. And here you can see the shorter Vexar, the terminal has gotten out the top. And uh, they can also change the seedling form as the branches can't develop naturally. So you can end up with some very funny looking trees. Um, here's an example. This was up in Capitol Forest near Olympia. And it was an area that has quite a bit of um, elk traffic. And this seedling, this little ankle biter seedling was actually planted five years earlier than the one in the blue tube. So in that particular site, without um, putting on a seedling protector, it's, it was just basically impossible to get the trees, uh, the cedars growing well. So protectors, um, as I mentioned before, they need regular maintenance. The tube supports, the stakes will rot and break. And um, whether it's branches falling or the wind or animals, it's, it's just, you can go out, you know, a year after you put them on and find seedling protectors all over the place. So if you're going to use them, you know, you've invested quite a bit of money in the protectors and the stakes, you need to invest some additional time in the maintenance. Um, but here's a happy seedling that was um, treated several times with repellent. It was never put in a seedling protector and that was uh, that was effective on this site in Western Washington. So um, I worked with a wildlife biologist once who was really keen on people thinking about using mini fences. And he said, sometimes you just want to get the groups of trees established in key areas, like some spots in riparian zones. And he said, try making some really small little fences. The animals are much more likely to move around the fence than try to jump in or push through it. So sometimes you can do some little mini fence areas to get some trees established. And in some cases, then you can move the fencing later and get new areas established. But instead of thinking, oh, I'm gonna just fence this whole area and um, you know that would be very expensive and difficult, but you might be able to achieve your objectives by putting in these little mini fences. 
So seedling type, there's a lot of choices. Um, many nurseries grow Western red cedar these days. Bare root seedlings are cheaper and um, they have a, a woody stem. Uh, so they're less likely to lose most of the top to animal bites, uh, browsing. Uh, plug or containerized seedlings, they may have more active root tips, good growth potential. They're easier to plant, the smaller root systems. They're more expensive and they can be more prone to setbacks with browsing. So, um, you know, you'll have to see what's available and, and what you think the trade-offs are. So, uh, in the future, there'll be more options of um, seedlings or cuttings that are browse resistant, but habitat is still going to be important. So you still need to, to consider what other things the, the animals might eat in your area. So in terms of selecting your seed source, um, Regardless of what species you're looking at, I like people to think about climate smart seed sources. So um, you'd want to match the current or the future climate. Um, so you might want to select slightly non-local seed sources. That is, you may want to move sources up in elevation, like you could plant something that was from a zero to 2000 foot source at a site with an elevation of, two, of 2500 feet or consider moving them north or inland. But in general, you don't want to move sources to sites lower in elevation, further south or further toward the coast. So the reason for that is just so you'll have the better long-term match of the climate where the seed was collected from and where it would be grown. So there is kind of a neat online tool called the Seedlot Selection Tool that was um, developed by some colleagues that can help you match the planting site with appropriate seed source areas. So you just have to see what kind of choices you have, but it's kind of a fun tool to look at. And there's a, a link on the PowerPoint if you, if you look at this later. So I mentioned that red cedar has less genetic variability than Douglas fir, and that means uh, fewer seed zones. So you can see how many more zones there are for Douglas fir than for Western red cedar in or Western Oregon. Okay, so a lot of people have heard about this um, red cedar breeding program. Um, they've initially started looking at just browsing deer and elk damage, but then they're actually looking at other things too. So they're looking at foliar blights and hardwood, heartwood durability and growth. And they've been um, working on this for quite a while. Unfortunately, the person who was the, in charge of this John Russell geneticist up in British Columbia, died a couple of years ago, and, but I'm, there's still a lot of interest in this program. So one of the things that John and his colleagues found is that the terpenes, it's a chemical in the foliage, they taste bad to um, a lot of deer and elk. So if you look at this example, failed means heavily browsed. So the ones that had a high degree of failure are ones that didn't have much of these um, terpenes. And the ones that were not browsed much had a lot of the terpenes. So they put in a, operational scale browsing trials and they tried mixes of seedlings that had high terpenes and those that didn't and those that had um, those that cuttings that had high terpenes and different seedlings and mixing plantings with Douglas fir to see, you know, what kind of combinations might work. And one of the things that they were kind of surprised to find is that there's too much variation. And if you have a tree that is um, browse resistant, Collecting the seed from that tree does not ensure that the, the seedlings you grow from that tree will be browse resistant. So what they found is you really need to have rooted cuttings. And so several of the nurseries now are starting to produce rooted cuttings that have some browse resistance. I don't think those are widely available yet, but I expect they're going to be in the next few years. So, you know, stay tuned for more on that. 
So um, sometimes people ask about naturals versus nursery grown seedlings. And the naturals generally have lower nutrient content in them. So they tend to be less likely to be browsed. But the growth potential of naturals or wildlings is initially not very high. So remember, because they don't have these leaf banks, they depend on current conditions to make new leaves. So if you um, have kind of cut off their roots and uh, they're not very nutrient rich, um, it's going to take them a few years to really get established. Um, so the nursery stock may be healthier and have a better balance of roots to top, but naturals may be special to you. That is, you know, you may have some trees on your property that um, you would like to reproduce and you could certainly collect seed or take, make cuttings from them. So when to plant, um, this depends on if you, if you think you're going to have a big browsing problem, but it also depends on when seedling stocks available. So if you don't have a browsing problem and the stocks available, I would certainly recommend that you try and plant in the fall. So plants can get the roots established and you know, really be ready for growth in the spring. If you can't get stock <laughs> until the winter, which is common in a lot of nurseries, and browsing is likely to be a problem, you may want to add seedling protectors or on some sites, you know, do your best to hide the seedlings in kind of brushier areas. You know, or plant later in the winter or the spring when there's going to be more vegetation available for, uh, for the deer and elk. Um, but the, there will be a trade-off with establishing roots before summer. So it's particularly, that would be particularly problem, problematic if you have these sites that dry out very quickly in the summer. So what spacing should you plant at? Most people are not planting cedar in large areas. They tend to be planting them in gaps or small areas. So spacing is um, probably not super important. And you know, if you're planting in a riparian area, understory or small gaps, you may want to plant in small clumps. But if you're doing larger plantings, you want to plant more densely than you would pick a spur. So say plant um, an eight by 10 foot spacing or even slightly closer if you will, um, if you will thin them. If you won't thin them, then <laughs> don't plant any closer than that. Um, you're probably going to get some mortality and some heavy browsing. So, you know, you don't want to plant too widely. And also if you plant too widely, um, the lower branches can become quite large and you can get quite a bit of stem taper. So even if it would be feasible, um, Irrigation is not usually needed in most cases. Um, but if you do irrigate, if you've got something, you know, right by a, um, right by a water source, make sure you restrict it to early or midsummer. Because if you start, um, continue to irrigate past about the middle of August, it keeps the foliage growing too long into the fall. So it's be more susceptible to cold damage. Um, Fertilization is not needed for establishment. Um, I've heard people say many times over the years that red cedar is not responsive to silviculture, but I disagree. <laughs> um, I think the fact that it was less genetically variable, somehow some people got the ideas that it wouldn't respond to silviculture, but in fact, it's, it's very responsive to management. So this is just an example from a study I was involved in out on the Washington coast. And uh, if you look at the upper graph, that's uh, diameter growth and the bottom line uh, with the kind of purpley triangles was no thinning, no fertilizer. And then the next line up is the trees were thin and then the lines going up. Um, this was a poor site, so it was very responsive to fertilizer. So the very best ones were thinned and had nitrogen and phosphorus applied. And they also responded in, in height growth, but 
on a lot of sites, thinning is going to be your major tool, but some sites, if, if uh, they're uh, not nutrient rich, they may respond to, uh, to fertilization. So um, this was a study done to look at how red, um, red cedar in the mid-story would respond. And we could see even if it had been suppressed for many years, it responded to release. So you could see, you know, quite a good increase in growth. And we also um, had a study uh, near Olympia where we removed the overstory above some saplings and pole sized trees. And we saw in that case that releasing the overstory, taking the overstory off definitely increase the growth of the, the mid-story trees, the saplings and pole-sized trees, but fertilization didn't really have an effect. So as I mentioned earlier, shade-tolerant species like red cedar retain lower branches much longer than their less tolerant associates. So the ones um, kind of right in the middle of the screen are ones where those are Douglas fir, that don't have any lower branches. And then you can see how the cedars of about the same size have a lot more uh, lower branches that have survived. So red cedar can uh, retain its lower branches for many years. And so uh, it can result in large lower branches. Um, so pruning stems when young is an option. Um, people ask me, well, how should I prune? And so uh, the general rule of thumb for many species is remove no more than one third of the live crown at a time. Uh, the best time to do it is when the pruning saw is in your hand. That is, I don't think what time of year it matters for cedar. Um, but there's always going to be this balance between cleaning up the lower stem, which can invite antler rub, <laughs> and uh, uh, and pruning and giving you a nice clean lower stem. So that's just something you need to experiment with. So how, how should you manage red cedar? Well, it could be managed a lot of different ways because of its shade tolerance. It could be managed in mixed species stands or uneven age stands. Um, but it can also be managed as an overstory tree with, you know, with pretty go good growth rates. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you don't want it to be at too wide a spacing so that you get really wide crowns and large branches. Um, but sometimes people think about, well, we can manage in these mixed species uneven age stands, and they think that the growth rates will be high. But the growth rates are not going to be high in, in an understory condition unless the tree has got a fair amount of light. So, um, so just think about you know, what some of the options might be. So as I mentioned, um, you probably want to plant at, you know, like eight or nine foot spacing on a poor site, maybe 10 to 12 foot spacing on a good site. Consider pruning to manage the lower branches. Um, you know, start by removing that, you know, one third of the live crown. And you can try keeping some buffer trees unpruned or prune up some sacrificial extra trees. Uh, there's, there's just, uh, you know, it's, you trying to outwit the deer and elk that are out there. So there's um, one of the references that I listed in the resource section by Klinka and Briscoe says that, um, you know, selection of a thinning or planting regime for a particular red cedar stand is a decision that will depend on blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Limited knowledge, blah, blah, blah. So it's locally, it must remain a local and largely personal decision. So there's no, you know, perfect answer or right answer. Um, depends on what you're trying to do, what kind of site you have, um, you know, what resources you have available. Generally, you'd want to delay the first thinning until the lower branches are dead or after it's been pruned. And if you have you know, consider stem form when thinning. So if you have a few trees that have high taper, you might want to remove those somewhat dominant trees in an early thinning and release trees that have good form. So a few um, kind of final thoughts for this section. 
Cedars can survive well on the understory, but they can also be managed in overstory positions. Um, some have stated, which I disagree with, that cedars are slow growing, but they are capable of fast growth rates on good sites, um, you know, in the right kind of crown position and of responding to silvicultural practices like other species. So um, I mentioned this online resources. So um, Glenn mentioned where you can find this and each one of these has a, a link and a, a sentence or brief description of, of what's in these. Some of them are available as hard copy and some of them are just available online. So let's um, pause and see what kinds of questions people have about management of red cedar. All right, we have quite a few questions. So we'll go ahead and start on those. And it looks like we should have time uh, for some of your other information. So I'll just start right out here. This one on establishment. Um, it seems to be difficult to establish in open pastures or with grasses, uh, maybe wet meadows. Um, is that the way it is or did he or she just mismanage? Um, how about establishing red cedar in open meadows, pastures, grasses? Well, um, grasses can be uh, you know, fierce competitors to any tree species that you're trying to establish. Um, you may want to check with the local NRCS to see what kind of recommendations they would have for the particular species that you're working with. Um, you know, you may want to do some spot treatment um, of the grasses in areas that you're going to plant. So, um, Yes, it, for some reason it seems like if we want to put something somewhere, we have to really work at it. So, so uh, but some of those grassy areas can be very challenging. Yeah, and that's true for planting almost any tree in grass. There's so many, the, the competition uh, for moisture uh, and particularly the rodent habitat. If you look closely at seedlings in grass, oftentimes they're being chewed uh, at the base by rodents. So there's often quite a, a gain to be made from just controlling the grass around the seedlings and keeping some bare areas when they're getting established. Um, another, here's more of a, an observation from someone uh, who I know has a lot of experience with red cedar, um, both in riparian areas and in, in forestry outside riparian areas. So um, they planted thousands of Western red cedars in areas of heavy browse. They've been successful using solid four by 24 inch tubes, the blue tubes, sitting on the soil that helps protect them from mountain beavers, or boomers as we call them. Um, also looking at using the uh, Vexar tubes, the mesh tubes, uh, four by 18 inch, um, just to protect the top leaves and they need to maintain them so they lift them up as the tree grows. Um, uh, so that's another combination. Uh, they also observed that uh, using plant skid, one of the animal rep big game repellents, applied particularly in spring, April and June. Um, so a lot of different things they've done, but they've been successful. So there's hope there. Uh, protectors should be kept on until the tree is about five feet tall. So that's sort of your, when you get them to five feet, <laughs> uh, chances are they're gonna get away, but there can often be this period of you know maintenance with multiple techniques that can work using both the blue tubes, Vexar tubes. These even doubled up and used Vexar on the, or use the blue tube <laughs> uh, on the bottom for the mountain beavers and lower down and then put a mesh tube on top for the, the uh, tip browsing. Um, so that, that was an observation from. Ohio. Yeah, no, that, that's great. I'm really glad to, to hear that because I know there have been people that have been very successful in, in planting red cedar. And um, uh, I also have some friends that have, have been pretty successful. But, you know, one of the friends said, uh, but I don't want to plant anymore for a few years because that's a lot of work to keep moving those projectors and things. But, but you know, there's quite a sense of satisfaction when you actually get the stand established. And as was mentioned in the comment that Glenn shared, um, in some cases, they're just pulling the protectors up 
and so they're leaving the base of the uh, of the seedling unprotected and that works fine because what you're really trying to do is protect the very top part of it so so that is definitely a useful um, way of doing things and, and, sometimes, mountain beavers. and sometimes people will even um, uh, have a protector in the bottom and then as the seedlings are just starting to come out the top they might put some um, repellent on them so protecting that tip very good. Okay. Then uh, pertaining to the, the seed source, um, there's some variety of questions about that. Um, if your elevation is 2,500, why would you plant a seed source from zero to 2,000? I think a little more explanation of why you would be moving uh, it up in elevation a little bit. Yeah, so um, generally trees from um, lower elevations are going to have a little better growth potential than ones from higher elevations. But at higher elevations, the climate is warming. So um, there's not a lot of risk in making small changes in how you move seed sources. So you don't want to take something from Southern California and plant it uh, coast and plant it up, you know, in the Cascades or plant it way far north. But by moving things a little bit um, up in elevation or a, a little bit north, you should be able to take advantage of a better match between what the um, future climate is going to be and the climate conditions where that particular seed source um, uh, originated from. So that's just a general recommendation that you can move things up a little bit in elevation, um, move them a little bit inland or or north so uh not long distances not you know not a huge amount but but a small amount is likely to give you a good uh, a good balance and as i mentioned that seed source selection tool they have a really nice um some examples online and there's a little video uh, a webinar actually um by brad st Clair and glenn howe about how to use the tool to match things. And so you can see how the climate has changed in the past to now and how it's predicted to continue to change in the future. So you're just trying to get the right balance between um, you know, the, the climates of the seed source and the climates of the planting site. And, and a follow up on that from another person, it, uh, if we're at sea level, how do we move a seed source from a lower elevation? Uh, is there another <laughs> suggestion? Um, yeah, so you try and find something from further south and, and, and move it north. And, and, you know, that gets into that general question about, you know, anticipating climate change. Just as you mentioned, looking back, you know, we're seeing in the last 30 years, you know, these episodes that have been a lot of uh, drought and heat stress. And so we're anticipating that and we want to be um, you know, planting things that are resistant to that in the future. But as far as anticipating just how much it changes or moving, how far would you move a seed source? That's a real current topic of a lot of research. Uh, one way we refer to that is assisted migration, where you're helping trees move north or up in elevation faster than they would naturally. So I just would point out that that's something a lot of folks are just now really studying in British Columbia. They've actually seen a lot more changes in climate recently and for decades changes in the future. So they've actually um, formally adopted seed zones that do what Connie is saying, moving things a little bit north or a little bit up in elevation. Uh, here in the Northwest, in the US, we haven't quite gotten there yet. We're kind of working on, on the research uh, around assisted migration. Um, but I will now switch to this one. Um, uh, any opinion on use of inoculated biochar in lieu of commercial fertilizer? Uh, I think biochar is um, is a very interesting uh, product, and I, I think it could definitely be useful on some sites. I guess it's just a question of you know availability and um, you know the ability to get it out on the site. It, you know it, these organic products tend to be heavier than than a, a non 
organic fertilizer would be, but I think they can do an excellent job. So I, I would definitely be in favor of the biochar if it was, you know, available to you. Uh, here's a, a, a basic question. Could you explain a live crown again? I didn't quite get that. Uh, clarify what live crown and crown. Yeah, is. sorry, that's a good question. Um, so the live cr the crown of the tree, uh, the live crown is the part of the crown that it has live branches. So, um, you know, if you're, you're saying not to prune more than one third of the live crown, if the tree say is, is uh, 20 feet tall, but the bottom five feet doesn't have any live branches, then you'd say the live crown is 15 feet tall. It was 15 feet. And if you're not going to remove more than one third of the live crown, then you would be pruning from say five feet up to 10 feet. Yeah, and we use the crown ratio or just the amount of crown as a good indicator of how healthy and vigorous a tree is. So, uh, Are there spacing charts based on bowl diameter uh, like for red cedar, similar to what we have for other species? Trees per acre and average diameter and how many trees is the right number at a given diameter of stem. I have one that um, I have in my extra slides I can show in a minute. Okay, yes, and I, and yes, we do have uh, thinning guides and spacing guidelines based on diameter and trees per acre for red cedar. Uh, that's that one. How do western red cedars do in fire disturbed soil? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, uh, you know, I think you, red cedars can grow well on sites that have previously been burned or not been burned, but um, they're obviously they have very thin bark. So, you know, they're fire susceptible species, but, but once the fire has gone through, then, um, you know, certainly cedars can be can be put back on the site if if uh, the landowner wants to try that. I think another aspect of that is, of course, in light of recent events with fire um, in a lot of our territory here where we do have red cedar and would like to plant it, it's sort of that question of that environment after a fire, what's it gonna be like for us to establish seedlings? And a lot of times cedar on exposed sites or you know hot open sites without any shelter, it can be a little bit more stressful, more difficult to establish. And we find that, you know, planting them in the shade behind a stump or even resorting to artificial shade, um, you know, it's easier to establish cedars when there's a little shade. So a burned environment, especially if it's blackened and it gets hotter in the summer, that could be a bit of a, a harsh test for the young seedlings. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And that, you know, planting it behind a, a stump or the shade of some other vegetation or with a shade block or something can be, you know, certainly things to try. And then um, an observation, um, I leave Vexar tubes on even when tall to combat antler rub. So that's a, a key aspect of protecting the cedars even when they, you think they've made it. Um, what do you do about antler rub? Yeah, well, I've seen people do that, and um, I think sometimes it can be successful to to leave the Vexar on. Some of the Vexar does not decompose as rapidly as the manufacturers used to claim, and so the the risk is that the Vexar can actually damage the stem over time. So. You know, you would just need to keep an eye on it. I think it can definitely help in reducing some of that antler rubbing, but you need to make sure that, the, you know, as the stems get larger, you know, up to the diameter of the Vexar tubing, that they're actually cut off the stem. Okay. Um, with respect to pruning, is that done primarily just to manage the taper or is there a wood quality aspect to pruning as well? Uh, yeah, both uh, it, to manage the taper, but also uh, to produce um, logs with smaller branches. So 
it, it's just going to depend on what the um, uh, what the markets are in your area, whether or not there is a, a premium for small knot sizes. But particularly for red cedar, those lower branches can be maintained for a long time. And so you can get very large diameter uh, branches. And so, you know, you may be able to have a higher log quality if um, you did some early pruning or you were managing the, the, the stand density so you wouldn't have such large branches. Um, a question, you advise against pruning trees that have been drilled by sap suckers. Why uh, would it not be beneficial to such trees? Why wouldn't you prune them? I, I've just seen sap sucker damage on a few species and it's pretty clear that the sap suckers will come and hit the same tree over and over again. So um, you're not going to get the wood quality uh, benefits on a tree that's riddled with sap suckers. So, you know, if there's only a couple holes, well, you know, I would ignore that. But if it's pretty clear that it's been hit quite a bit, um, in my experience, the same trees are often hit year after year. So, or even within the same year. So I, I would just tend to think of those as being, you know, the less likely candidates. You're probably not going to prune every tree in your area. So, you know, just think of that as, well, that's a wildlife tree rather than a the tree that you're trying to grow a, a high quality log on. Okay. Um, a clarifying question about fire disturbance. So how would seedlings and not adults do in areas of fire disturbance? Um, so I'm guessing um, if, they, if they're surviving, that's one question, um, or how, would they, how well do they survive a fire? That I guess would be a different question. So I think maybe answer both of those. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Um, I mean, I, I think that blackened ground is, is uh, you know, there may be some differences in soil characteristics, but I think the microclimate differences with those blackened sites is, is going to be the major issue in a recently burned site. So to me, this raises another question that I have, um, and that you see a lot of times with cedar, if it's in an understory or it's in a shaded environment, and then if you remove overstory or if there's disturbance, uh, trees that are exposed, like on the edge of a neighbor's, you know, clear cut, we see a lot of cedar struggling. Uh, in fact, a lot of the old timers around here say, if, if you've got cedars that are suddenly exposed by a clear cut, you know, they're not going to do well. Uh, we see a lot of cedars suffer from sudden exposure, which to me raises questions about if we want to release the cedar, um, you know, how careful do we need to do to not to shock it with too much exposure, too much too fast? Uh, do you have any insight on that? Well, we've done a couple of research studies, uh, had a couple of research sites in which we removed the overstory trees and um, the cedars were not shocked. They, they grew much better after they were released. Or the, you know, the ones that were released grew much better than the ones that weren't released. But I think it's going to depend on the, um, how healthy the tree was before it was released, and you know, kind of what the stand conditions were. And you know, if it's a steep south-facing slope, and you had a tree that wasn't particularly um, vigorous to begin with then you've got this kind of kind of shade foliage that's less um, you know not going to do as well when you give it full sun but in general i don't think you need to be overly concerned about releasing them. i mean what's better from a management standpoint is if you do things in a more gradual sense rather than waiting until the trees are you know very overtopped and then go in and release them. But we've seen this with several species, whether it's cedar or oak. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's better to decide ahead of time what you want and move the stand in that direction, but that um, most of the trees actually do seem to release fairly well and, uh, and are not 
really shocked in that sense. Okay, good. I think actually when I'm thinking about some of the observations were also about the mature, the overstory trees, like at the edge of a clear cut, when the neighbor clear cut, the overstory cedar that was suddenly exposed um, actually seemed to suffer more. You know, they have a big canopy up there and they get a lot more exposure all of a sudden. So we seem to decline in the larger cedars um, uh, as distinguished from the understory cedars. Is that, is that something you've looked at at all? Just how large trees do when they're exposed uh, with, you know, being left in a isolated uh, but exposed situation? Uh, no, we, we've, you know, looked at effect on kind of pole sized trees mm -hmm. and, you know, the understory, midstory, but not the very large trees. But you certainly see them, you know, in, in um, clear cuts with you know, green tree retention. There'll be some out there and sometimes they look a little feeble for us <laughs> for a few years. Um, but generally the ones that they're leaving in some of the green tree retention um, units uh, were not the best looking trees to begin with. So, you know, you have to kind of really understand what they look like before. Right. Okay, um, another observation from one of our experienced uh, cedar planters uh, in riparian areas, we protect our cedars with just short 12 inch by three foot, oh, larger 12 inch diameter by three foot tall range wire. So it's a two by two wire grid with tubes. Um, they stake it with fence posts. So they're protecting it from river beavers. Uh, so that's, that's the more uh, wire fence type of approach when you have river beavers because they'll chew your cedars. Yeah, we've used chicken wire. Um and other kinds of, of materials to make cages. And it's, it's kind of, if you're only planting a few, the, the chicken wire kind of approach um, or other kinds of wire is, um, is kind of appealing because you end up with a really nice looking tree. You haven't smashed all the branches into some real small diameter uh, protector. But on the other hand, depending on the size of the the grid and how tall they are, uh, sometimes you can get the deer to just stick their heads right into the grid or um, up on the top. I This is kind of a little side thing related to maple. We had some maple seedlings that were planted in these chicken wire cages and we came back at one point and they were just the stem and then these petioles and it's like well how, how you know they were like four foot tall cages or something and it's like well how the heck did this happen and the deer would get in there with their tongues and they would get a hold of the edge of the leaves and they would pull them out the edge of the wire <laughs> and munch them off and then the stem would you know kind of snap back to the middle so um, it, sometimes if you have hungry animals they can be very clever in figuring out how to get rid of things but on the other hand some some of these different techniques that people have developed and are happy with. I, I think it's great. There's a lot of, I'm glad to hear of the successes that people have and different types of protectors. All right, another question popped up. Um, do you rec recommend leaving some red alder in cedar plantations for nitrogen fixation? Uh, you want to answer that one, Glenn? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I mean, certainly red alder is a, um, you know, is a nitrogen fixing species. And I've actually thought that alder and cedar are um, nice partners. So you've got the alder that's fixing nitrogen, the cedar can be a calcium accumulator. So they seem to kind of have some leaf chemistry things that they're kind of sharing. Um, generally, the alder is going to have much more rapid juvenile growth, and so it's going to zip up past the cedars. The cedars may, um, you know, grow moderately well in the understory, but they'll grow better over time if then the alder can be maybe thinned back from some of the cedars, so they're not just growing long term in an understory position. But I do think it's a combination that, that really can be a good one. Yeah, in our s studies of alder and cedar together, uh, first the cedar certainly does better in the understory with alder than Douglas fir would, for example, because of its shade tolerance. 
and as Connie said, it's, as you said, it's uh, compatibility, I think, between them. Um, so I think there's a lot of promise in growing those two together, as long as you can kind of keep them, their growth rate somewhat uh, balanced. But we have some studies of uh, mixing it on purpose um, that we're, we're just getting some results from. And also, you know, clumped versus uh, uniform distribution. So if you have a clump of alder um, and the cedar next to it, um, and thinning the alder to keep space for cedar under it. Uh, those are things that we think could work well with the mixture. Um, we're out of questions that are in the box now, and I'm thinking, is would this be a good time to uh, promote the upcoming uh, workshops before we go into maybe the other uh, slides that you have? Or are those, what's your next slide? Oh, well, that should be my next slide. Okay. There. All right, good. Good. Yeah, we just wanted to take a, uh, a minute to promote the next Tree School online webinar, which is Tuesday, October 6th. Uh, we'll have uh, Tammy Cushing, our, um, our forestry business extension specialist, um, and that'll be uh, on October 6th, 3 to 4. And again, you can go online to the Tree School online um, website at um, the knowyourforest.org site. To find out more about that. And then there's another uh, series of classes uh, in Eastern Oregon. There's a whole series of Forests of Eastern Oregon that's ongoing now uh, that John punches um, and, uh, and, and Jacob are working on. And you can find that also on the Tree School site as well as on their Eastern Oregon Forest site. It's shown here. And with that, I think I will do a quick little um, poll about this and then we might go into a little overtime on some of your other slides because there's still some folks uh, that I expect would like to, to see what you got to say. So let's run a, a poll here um, and I have to find the, the wrap up poll we call it. So if you would just tell us a little bit about uh, what you thought of the, the webinar and um, that gives us some feedback for the future. We won't show those results, but if you would just fill those in um, and we'll, we'll learn from your experience. And so then, uh, Connie, if you like, um, first I'd say thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we still got some time left and we can go into overtime at least till, uh, at most till 4.45, um, but we've got a few minutes left right now. So go ahead, Connie, and tell us some more. Uh, this laptop is driving me nuts today. I'm sorry. <laughs> Never had this problem before. Let me. Uh, just... you, you wanted to, you've done well rebooting it each time or restarting it. So, but if yeah. you if you have trouble, I can also bring it up and finish it with you. Um, okay. Let me just uh, stop share for a second, and then I'll bring it back up again. All right. <laughs> uh, I I don't know what, why it's doing that. So I just wanted to share some additional information on uh, growth of red cedar under different kinds of conditions. And we got data from all kinds of sources from forest inventory in the uh, US, but also in uh, British Columbia from uh, more than 3000 plots. Um, and uh, Many of them were remeasured points, so we had quite a bit of information on how the trees grew over time. And so um, the next couple slides, we're going to be talking about diameter, the breast height, and basal area, which is the cross-sectional area of the tree stems, add it all together. And then BAL, which is the basal area of trees larger than the tree being evaluated. So um, I'll kind of refer to those in a minute. So first, we have a curve here. We're looking at diameter growth per year versus initial size. I can't so we see have... your screen, Connie. I'm sorry. Pardon me? Are you sharing the slide? I thought I was. Oh, OK. Yeah, I'm not seeing it for some reason. OK. Well, do you want me that. to bring it up? You've done well so far restarting it as with these little glitches we've had. Here it comes. Now I see it.
Okay. So, um, so did you see the map before? Uh, no, this is it okay. the first time. Okay. So just to show you, we had data from a lot of different places, <laughs> a lot of plots, um, a lot of places. And we're going to be looking at these kind of three measures. So diameter of an individual tree, then what the basal area is of the whole stand. And then also we looked at the basal area of trees, what percentage of that basal area, we're looking at the percentage of basal area larger than the tree being evaluated. So, okay, here in this first example, this is just looking at the growth of an individual tree. So like out in the open with no competition. And so we get maximum growth of both species in that kind of 12 to 16 inch initial diameter. And then, you know, trees that are very small grow less and trees that are bigger um, grow less, but it's, but the maximum growth of the Douglas fir is greater than the growth of the red cedar. And so this Douglas fir curve came from Organon, which is a growth model that many of you may have used. And then the red cedar curve was fit from the data that I was showing you from all those different points. Okay, so now let's say that we have three different levels of basal area. So three different levels of stand competition. Um, and 25, we'll say 25% of this basal area is in trees bigger than, you know, bigger than the study tree. And so you can see if you have just a little bit um, of competition, the difference between the Douglas fir and the red cedar curves um, goes down substantially. And as you get to more and more competition, then the um, red cedar would actually be growing better as some of this competition is um, greater than trees larger than the tree you're studying. So this is just another way of looking at this effect of shade tolerance, that red cedar is not going to outgrow Douglas fir um, in a full light situation, but if you're interested in having different trees grow together, um, you can see how the difference between the species gets less and then quickly flips. But on the other hand, the growth is much, much lower the more competition you have. Um, and in the, this example, the, you know, there's most of the competition is is the same size or smaller than you are, that BAL is 25%. But if we, if we go where the BAL is 75%, so this means that most of the competition is, um, is in trees larger than the tree that you're evaluating, then you can see how quickly the situation changes where you know, the, the cedar and Douglas fir may be growing the same at a low level of competition, but the higher the competition gets, um, the better the cedar looks in comparison to the Douglas fir. I, I, this this may be something you need to think about a little bit, but it's it's really I think an interesting way to look at it with different levels of competition and and um, and whether the trees are. Uh, the same size or smaller than you are, or whether they're actually larger than the tree you're interested in. So, and then the um, SMC Organon model um, has, doesn't show the high growth rates that red cedar is capable of. And so um, I only bring this up from the standpoint of sometimes people do modeling um, and they they say, well, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter 
if I'm thinning, it doesn't matter what the competition is because it's just not gonna, it's gonna grow the same. And I think that's just um, a recognition of the fact that most of the growth and yield models don't have very much information in them uh, for the less common species. And so like the organon equations were fit with only about a hundred trees, whereas in our data set, we ended up with 46,000 observations. So, uh, so I feel, you know, like our, our general relationship here is, is a good one. And I'm not saying that, um, just keep it in mind that if you, if you do have data from growth and yield model, it may be way underestimating how well the cedars can grow. So just something to think about. So then, um, question came up about a stand density management diagram. And these are, if you're not used to them, they're a bit confusing. <laughs> uh, but down at the bottom, you have density. So that's number of trees per area. And then um, the other axis, you have mean tree volume. And um, trees can, um, the more competition there is, the slower they're going to be growing. And what you wanna do is try and manage them uh, below the, the point where they're gonna just be naturally dying. Um, um, you know, above where you have crown closure, but below where they're dying. So you, 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 there's a lot of different options. So you could decide if you want, how, you, how quickly you wanna achieve crown closure, but just recognize that all trees are not gonna survive. So, you know, the faster you want individual trees to grow, the lower the density. And so this is in one of those references um, that I provided that Silvix and Silviculture of Coastal Western Red Cedar that came from British Columbia. And um, uh, so hopefully if you're interested in that kind of detail, just be aware that this information uh, is available. And just, just there are, we looked at our current data comparing diameter on the bottom, which is on a log scale with, with number of trees on the other axis. And it just each one of the data sets is slightly different, but you know, fairly similar in terms of you know, the larger diameter um, that you want to manage, the lower the density that you would be wanting to manage for. So I'll stop there unless there's uh, uh, any question on that last little bit. Yeah, um, actually, I wanted to point out if you want to get a hold of Connie and follow up because he's getting deep into some of the science here and it, revealing what a, uh, um, a long-term silvicultural research program looks like and how you really get more answers over time as you look deeper and especially get more data. If you want to get a hold of Connie, um, her email will be in the resources. And I should note that we had it wrong in one of the slides. You're, we, instead of USDA.gov, we had UDSA or something like that. So you always want to make sure you have the right email and we'll provide that in the resources uh, when you follow up after today. And there is a question here. Um, moving on to comparisons with Doug Fur, any comments on Sitka spruce would be welcome too, especially with kind of the habitat and the light levels and you know the, the mixing with spruce and cedar. Yeah, Sitka spruce is another one of those neglected species. Um, uh, you know, both because it's generally uh, less. Uh, you know, markets are not as good for producing that, but also because of the tip weevil. So try it. But I think it's a very interesting species to, depending on the site, in some cases, you know, you can get very large diameter spruce um, that can serve the same ecological role that maybe Douglas fir would serve on some other sites. So um, if you have the right kind of site conditions, you know, especially some of those wetter sites toward the coast, I think spruce and cedar and you know, other mixed species stands can be very interesting ones. Okay, very good. And oh, another question popped up. 
no, I just haven't finished uh, this one. Now, you're f no more questions in the queue. So if you have some more you'd like to share, we're into overtime now, um, but uh, we'll hang around for a little longer as long as you've got material and people have uh, interests and questions. So go ahead. So I, I just, this is one I, I had in the past when I gave the presentation at Tree School in the spring that we have these um, electronic dendrometers sometimes on some of our trees. And it's kind of interesting to actually see the, how the stems shrink and swell um, each day as they lose water and then, you know, rehydrate from the roots. Uh, but then you can see in this one, it was toward the end of February, all of a sudden it just really started, you know, bouncing around and, and, um, and growth rates started started picking up and I think it's very interesting to be able to look at some of these kinds of things so I thought I'd share it with you. You really have your finger on the pulse of this cedar tree here. Let's see. <laughs> yes. That's cool. All right is there anything else you have that you want to share Connie? Uh, no I think that's all I had. I, I, uh, I actually deleted several slides from the presentation to keep it from getting too too data uh, centric but I think I hit the high point so you know people are definitely welcome to send me email messages and as I have time since I'm retired I will <laughs> I'll try and answer your questions very good and I saw that we also put your correct email in the chat if someone wants to grab it from there before we close and um, really glad that you're able to keep sharing your accumulated wisdom um, about red cedar. I should also point out that Connie has another class on the biology and management of Oregon white oak which is another popular one um, and we hope to have that one in the queue. We don't have it lined up or a date for it yet, but I'm sure that that, if you're willing, Connie, that we'd like to have that class again someday. And so, um, yeah, Glenn, could you um, could you remind us what you said this the uh, first and third or what you know what? Yeah, so the schedule for be? for continuing Tree School Online. So this is the uh, from here forward, we're going to go the first and third Tuesday. So October 6th is the next one. We started this one September 15th. So we, we're not on the same first and third, but from now on, it okay. will be the first and third Tuesday. Uh, so the next one's October 6th. And after that will be um, October 20th and onward through uh, till June next year. So we only have six or so lined up for the next and we're gonna be working on the rest of the schedule as time goes. Um, I have to say we're going to probably have some more things focused on fire and fire recovery, given what's happened this year. Um, but Oregon White Oak will be a hot topic, and we'd hope to get you to come back and, and teach a class on that. Another one of my favorite species, neglected species. All right, so I went on long enough. Uh, here's an observation uh, from an experienced woodland owner. Wild honeysuckle can girdle rapidly growing cedar stems, often quite high on the tree. So when the honeysuckle wraps around a tree and climbs up it, it he's actually seen girdling. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that, but I have to admit that I think having a pair of pruning, um, you know, mini loppers or clippers or something in your pocket as you walk around is a really good idea to be able to cut those kind of things away. That, and if, or if you're unlucky enough to have English ivy, for instance, or other... Uh, less favorable spines. Very good. Well, I'm sure that person carries a, a clippers with him when he goes in the woods. Um, so that's probably a good way to manage that. Well, with that, I think we, we've, we've had a great afternoon session and there are no more questions. So last call. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Connie, for, for joining us. And thanks everyone for coming. And we'll hope to see you all at the next Tree School Online. October 6th. And tune into Eastern Oregon Forest. That's actually this on Thursday evening. So look for that one too if you're interested. So thanks everybody. And goodbye, Connie. Bye bye.